Jean-Paul Getty, known widely as J. Paul Getty, was an American-born British petrol industrialist who founded the Getty Oil Company in 1942 and was the patriarch of the Getty family. A native of Minneapolis, he was the son of pioneer oilman George Getty. In 1957, Fortune magazine named him the richest living American, while the 1966 Guinness Book of Records named him as the world's richest private citizen, worth an estimated $1.2 billion. At his death, he was worth more than $6 billion. A book published in 1996 ranked him as the 67th richest American who ever lived, based on his wealth as a percentage of the concurrent gross national product. Despite his vast wealth, Getty was famously frugal, notably negotiating his grandson's kidnapping ransom in 1973. He had five children and divorced five times. Getty was an avid collector of art and antiquities. His collection formed the basis of the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, more than $661 million of his estate was left to the museum after his death. He established the J. Paul Getty Trust in 1953. The Trust, which is the world's wealthiest art institution, operates the J. Paul Getty Museum complexes, the Getty Center, the Getty Villa, and the Getty Foundation, the Getty Research Institute, as well as the Getty Conservation Institute. Chapter 1 Early Life and Education Getty was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, to Sarah Catherine McPherson and George Getty, who was an attorney in the insurance industry. Getty was raised as a Methodist by his parents. His father was a devout Christian scientist and both were strict teetotalers. He was of part Scottish descent. In 1903, when Getty was ten years old, George Getty traveled to Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and bought the mineral rights for 1,100 acres of land. The Getty family subsequently moved to Bartlesville, where J. Paul Getty attended the Garfield School. Within a few years Getty had established wells on the land which were producing 100,000 barrels of crude oil a month. As newly minted millionaires, the family moved to Los Angeles. But, J. Paul Getty later returned to Oklahoma. At age 14, Getty attended Harvard Military School for a year, followed by Polytechnic High School, where he was given the nickname Dictionary Getty because of his love of reading. He became fluent in French, German, and Italian. Getty was also conversational in Spanish, Greek, Arabic, and Russian. A love of the classics led Getty to acquire reading proficiency in ancient Greek and Latin. He enrolled at the University of California, Berkeley, but did not complete a degree. Enamored of Europe after traveling abroad with his parents in 1910, Getty enrolled at the University of Oxford on November 28, 1912. A letter of introduction by then President of the United States William Howard Taft enabled him to gain independent instruction from tutors at Magdalen College. Although he was not registered at Magdalen, he claimed the aristocratic students accepted me as one of their own and he fondly boasted of the friends he made, including Edward VIII, the future King of the United Kingdom. He obtained a diploma in economics and political science from Oxford in June 1913, then spent months traveling throughout Europe and Egypt before meeting his parents in Paris and returning with them to America in June 1914. Chapter 2 Career? In the autumn of 1914, George Getty gave his son $10,000 to invest in expanding the family's oil field holdings in Oklahoma. The first lot he bought, the Nancy Taylor No. 1 oil well site near Haskell, Oklahoma was crucial to his early financial success. The well struck oil in August 1915 and by the next summer the 40% net production royalty he accrued from it had made him a millionaire. In 1919, Getty returned to business in Oklahoma. During the 1920s, he added about $3 million to his already sizable estate. His succession of marriages and divorces so distressed his father that Getty inherited only $500,000 of the $10 million fortune his father left at the time of his death in 1930. Getty was left with one-third of the stock from George Getty Incorporated, while his mother received the remaining two-thirds, giving her a controlling interest in 1936, 
Getty's mother convinced him to contribute to the establishment of a $3.3 million investment trust, called the Sarah C. Getty Trust, to ensure the family's ever-growing wealth could be channeled into a tax-free, secure income for future generations of the Getty family. The trust enabled Getty to have easy access to ready capital, which he was funneling into the purchase of Tidewater Petroleum stock. Shrewdly investing his resources during the Great Depression, Getty acquired Pacific Western Oil Corporation, and began the acquisition of the Mission Corporation, which included Tidewater Oil and Skelly Oil. In 1967, Getty merged these holdings into Getty Oil. In 1948 to 1949, Getty paid Ibn Saud $9.5 million in cash, guaranteed $1 million a year, and a royalty of 55 cents a barrel for the Saudi Arabian neutral zone concession. Oil was finally discovered in March 1953. Since 1953, Getty's gamble produced 16 million barrels a year, which contributed greatly to the fortune responsible for making him one of the richest people in the world. Getty's wealth and ability to speak Arabic enabled his unparalleled expansion into the Middle East. Getty owned the controlling interest in about 200 businesses, including Getty Oil. Getty owned Getty Oil, Getty Incorporated, George F. Getty Incorporated, Pacific Western Oil Corporation, Mission Corporation, Mission Development Company, Tidewater Oil, Skelly Oil, Mexican Seaboard Oil, Petroleum Corporation of America, Spartan Aircraft Company, Spartan Cafeteria Company, Mini Home Insurance Company, Mini Homer Financial Company, Pierre Hotel, Pierre Marx Hotel, a 15th century palace and nearby castle at Le Dispoli on the coast northwest of Rome, a Malibu ranch home, and Sutton Place. A 72 room mansion near Guildford, Surrey. Chapter 2 Section 1 Art Collection Getty's first forays into collecting began in the late 1930s, when he took inspiration from the collection of 18th-century French paintings and furniture owned by the landlord of his New York City penthouse, Amy Guest, a relation of Sir Winston Churchill. A fan of 18th-century France, Getty began buying furniture from the period at reduced prices because of the depressed art market. He wrote several books on collecting, including Europe and the 18th century, Collector's Choice, The Chronicle of an Artistic Odyssey Through Europe and The Joys of Collecting. His stinginess limited the range of his collecting because he refused to pay full price. Getty's companion in later life, Penelope Kitson, said Paul was really too mean ever to allow himself to buy a great painting. Nonetheless, at the time of his death he owned more than 600 items valued at more than $4 million, including paintings by Rubens, Titian, Gainsborough, Renoir, Teen Toretto, Degas, and Monet. During the 1950s, Getty's interests shifted to Greco-Roman sculpture, which led to the building of the Getty Villa in the 1970s to house the collection. These items were transferred to the Getty Museum, and the Getty Villa in Los Angeles after his death. Chapter 3, Marriages, Divorces and Children Getty was a notorious womanizer from the time of his youth, something which horrified his conservative Christian parents. His lawyer, Robin Lund, once said that, Paul could hardly ever say no to a woman, or yes to a man. Lord Beaverbrook had called him priapic and ever ready in his sexual habits. In 1917, when he was 25, a paternity suit was filed against Getty in Los Angeles by Elsie Ekstrom, who claimed he was the father of her daughter, Paula. Ekstrom claimed that Getty had taken her virginity and fathered the child, while his legal team tried to undermine her credibility by claiming that she had a history of promiscuity. Getty agreed to a settlement of $10,000 upon which Ekstrom left town with the baby. Getty was married and divorced five times. He had five sons with four of his wives. Jeanette Dumont, one son, George F. Getty II. Aline Ashby, no children. Getty met 17-year-old Ashby, the daughter of a Texas rancher, in Mexico City while he was studying Spanish and overseeing his family's business interests. They eloped to Cuernavaca, Mexico, but the marriage was bigamous as he was not yet divorced from Jeanette. The two quickly decided to dissolve the union while still in Mexico. 
Adolphine Helmel, one son, Jean Ronald Getty, whose son, Christopher Ronald Getty, married Pia Miller, sister of Marie Chantal, Crown Princess of Greece. Like his first and second wives, Adolphine was 17 years old when Getty met her in Vienna. She was the daughter of a prominent German doctor who was opposed to her marrying the twice-divorced, 36-year-old Getty. The two eloped to Cuernavaca, where he had married Aline Ashby, then settled in Los Angeles. Following the birth of their son, Getty lost interest in her and her father convinced her to return to Germany with their child in 1929. After a protracted and contentious battle, their divorce was finalized in August 1932, with Adolphine receiving a huge sum for punitive damages and full custody of Ronald. And Rourke, two sons, John Paul Getty Jr. and Gordon Peter Getty. Getty was introduced to Rourke when she was 14 years old, but she did not become his romantic partner until she was 21 in 1930. Because he was in the midst of his divorce from Adolphine, the couple had to wait two years before they married. He was largely absent during their marriage, staying for long stretches of time in Europe. She sued him for divorce in 1936 alleging emotional abuse and neglect. She described an incident while the two were abroad in Italy in which she claimed Getty forced her to climb to view the crater of Mount Vesuvius while she was pregnant with their first son. The court decided in her favor and she was awarded $2,500 per month alimony plus $1,000 each in child support for her sons. Louise Dudley Teddy Lynch, one son, Timothy Weir Getty. In 2013 at age 99, Getty's fifth wife, Louise, known as Teddy Getty Gaston, published a memoir reporting how Getty had scolded her for spending money too freely in the 1950s on the treatment of their six-year-old son, Timmy, who had become blind from a brain tumor. Timmy died at age 12, and Getty, living in England apart from his family, who were in the US, did not attend the funeral. Gaston divorced Getty that year. Teddy Gaston died in April 2017 at the age of 103. Getty was quoted as saying a lasting relationship with a woman is only possible if you are a business failure, and, I hate to be a failure. I hate and regret the failure of my marriages. I would gladly give all my millions for just one lasting marital success. Chapter 4, Kidnapping of Grandson John Paul Getty III in Rome on July 10, 1973, Drungheta kidnappers abducted Getty's 16-year-old grandson, John Paul Getty III, and demanded a $17 million payment for his safe return. However, the family suspected a ploy by the rebellious teenager to extract money from his miserly grandfather. John Paul Getty Jr. asked his father for the money, but was refused, arguing that his 13 other grandchildren could also become kidnapped targets if he paid. Dot in November 1973, an envelope containing a lock of hair and a human ear arrived at a daily newspaper. The second demand had been delayed three weeks by an Italian postal strike. The demand threatened that Paul would be further mutilated unless the victims paid $3.2 million. The demand stated this is Paul's ear. If we don't get some money within 10 days, then the other ear will arrive. In other words, he will arrive in little bits. When the kidnappers finally reduced their demands to $3 million, Getty agreed to pay no more than $2.2 million, the maximum that would be tax deductible. He lent his son the remaining $800,000 at 4% interest. Getty's grandson was found alive on December 15, 1973, in a Loria filling station, in the province of Potenza, shortly after the ransom was paid. After his release, the younger Getty called his grandfather to thank him for paying the ransom but Getty refused to come to the phone. Nine people associated with Drungetto were later arrested for the kidnapping, but only two were convicted. Getty III was permanently affected by the trauma and became a drug addict. After a stroke, brought on by a cocktail of drugs and alcohol in 1981, Getty III was rendered speechless, nearly blind and partially paralyzed for the rest of his life. He died on February 5, 2011, 
At the age of 54. Getty defended his initial refusal to pay the ransom on two points. He argued that his 13 other grandchildren could also become kidnapped targets if he paid, and also stated, the second reason for my refusal was much broader based. I contend that acceding to the demands of criminals and terrorists merely guarantees the continuing increase and spread of lawlessness, violence and such outrages as terror bombings, skyjackings and the slaughter of hostages that plague our present-day world. Nine of the kidnappers were apprehended, including Girolamo Piromali and Severio Mamaliti, high-ranking members of the Drungheta, a mafia organization in Calabria. Two of the kidnappers were convicted and sent to prison, the others were acquitted for lack of evidence, including the Drungheta bosses. Most of the ransom money was never recovered. Chapter 5 Reputation for Frugality Many anecdotal stories exist of Getty's reputed thriftiness and parsimony, which struck observers as comical, even perverse, because of his extreme wealth. The two most widely known examples are his reluctance to pay his grandson's $17 million kidnapping ransom, and a notorious pay phone he had installed at Sutton Place. A darker incident was his fifth wife's claim that Getty had scolded her for spending too much on their terminally ill son's medical treatment, though he was worth tens of millions of dollars at the time. He was well known for bargaining on almost everything to obtain the lowest possible price, including suites at luxury hotels and virtually all purchases of artwork and real estate. In 1959, Sutton Place, a 72-room mansion, was purchased from George Sutherland Leveson Gower, 5th Duke of Sutherland, for £60,000, about half of what the Duke paid for it 40 years earlier. Getty's secretary claimed that Getty did his laundry by hand because he didn't want to pay for his clothes to be laundered. When his shirts became frayed at the cuffs, he would trim the frayed part instead of purchasing new shirts. Reusing stationery was another obsession of Getty's. He had a habit of writing responses to letters on the margins or back sides and mailing them back, rather than using a new sheet of paper. He also carefully saved and reused manila envelopes, rubber bands and other office supplies. When Getty took a group of friends to a dog show in London, he made them walk around the block for 10 minutes until the tickets became half-priced at 5 p.m., because he didn't want to pay the full 5 shillings per head. Getty moved to Sutton Place in part because the cost of living was cheaper than in London, where he had resided at the Ritz. He once boasted to American columnist Art Buckwall that it cost 10 cents for a rum and coke at Sutton Place, whereas at the Ritz it was more than a dollar. Author John Pearson attributed part of Getty's extreme penny pinching to the Methodist sensibility of Getty's upbringing, which emphasized modest living and personal economy. His business acumen was also a major factor in Getty's thriftiness. He would allow himself no self-indulgence in the purchase of a place to live, a work of art, even a piece of furniture, unless he could convince himself that it would appreciate in value. Getty claimed his frugality towards others was a response to people taking advantage of him and not paying their fair share. It's not the money I object to, it's the principle of the thing that bothers me. Chapter 5 Section 1, Coin Box Telephone Getty famously had a payphone installed at Sutton Place, helping to seal his reputation as a miser. Getty placed dial locks on all the regular telephones, limiting their use to authorized staff, and the coin box telephone was installed for others. In his autobiography, he described his reasons. Now, for months after Sutton Place was purchased, great numbers of people came in and out of the house. Some were visiting businessmen. Others were artisans or workmen engaged in renovation and refurbishing. Still others were tradesmen making deliveries of merchandise. Suddenly, the Sutton Place telephone bills began to soar. The reason was obvious. Each of the regular telephones in the house has direct access to outside lines and thus to long distance and even overseas operators. All sorts of people were making the best of a rare opportunity. They were picking up Sutton Place phones and placing calls to girlfriends in Geneva or Georgia and to aunts, uncles and third cousins twice removed in Caracas and Cape Town. The costs of their friendly chats were, of course, 
charged, to the Sutton Place Bill. When speaking in a televised interview with Alan Wicker in February 1963, Getty said that he thought guests would want to use a payphone. After 18 months, Getty explained, the in and out traffic flow at Sutton subsided. Management and operation of the house settled into a reasonable routine. With that, the pay telephone removed, and the dial locks were taken off the telephones in the house. Chapter 6 Later Years and Death On June 30, 1960, Getty threw a 21st birthday party for a relative of his friend, the 16th Duke of Norfolk, which served as a housewarming party for the newly purchased Sutton Place. Partygoers were irritated by Getty's stinginess, such as not providing cigarettes and relegating everyone to using creosote portable toilets outside. At about 10 p.m. the party descended into pandemonium as party crashers arrived from London, swelling the already overcrowded halls and causing an estimated £20,000 in damage. A valuable silver ewer by the 18th century silversmith Paul de Lamery was stolen, but returned anonymously when the London newspapers began covering the theft. The failure of the event made Getty the object of ridicule, and he never threw another large party again. Getty remained an inveterate hard worker, boasting at age 74 that he often worked 16 to 18 hours per day overseeing his operations across the world. The value of Getty oil shares quadrupled during the Arab-Israeli Yom Kippur War of October 1973 which caused a worldwide oil shortage for years. Getty's earnings topped $25.8 million in 1975. Getty's insatiable appetite for sex also continued into his 80s. He used an experimental drug, H3, to maintain his potency. Getty met the English interior designer Penelope Kitson in the 1950s and entrusted her with decorating his homes and the public rooms of the oil tankers he was launching. From 1960, Kitson resided in a cottage on the grounds of Sutton Place. Getty and Kitson maintained a platonic relationship and Getty held her in high respect and trust. Other mistresses who resided at Sutton Place included the married Mary Tesia, a distant cousin of the last Tsar of Russia, Lady Ursula Darbo, who had close connections to the British royal family, and Nicaraguan-born Rosabella Birch. The New York Times wrote of Getty's domestic arrangement, ended his life with a collection of desperately hopeful women, all living together in his Tudor mansion in England, none of them aware that his favorite pastime was rewriting his will, changing his insultingly small bequests, $209 a month to one, $1,167 to another. Only Kitson received a significant bequest upon Getty's death, receiving 5,000 shares of Getty Oil, which doubled in value during the 1980s, and a $1,167 monthly income. Getty died of heart failure at the age of 83 on June 6, 1976, in Sutton Place near Guilford, Surrey. He was buried in Pacific Palisades, Los Angeles County. California at the Getty Villa. The grave site is not open to the public. Chapter 7, Media Portrayals Christopher Plummer portrayed Getty in the 2017 film All the Money in the World, which dramatizes the kidnapping of his grandson. Getty was originally portrayed by Kevin Spacey, but after sexual misconduct allegations surfaced against Spacey ahead of the film's premiere, Plummer was cast to re-film his scenes. For his performance, Plummer received an Academy Award nomination for Best Supporting Actor. The kidnapping is also dramatized in the first season of the American anthology drama series Trust, where Getty is portrayed by Donald Sutherland. Chapter 8, Published Works Getty, J. Paul The History of the Bigger Oil Business of George F. S. F. and J. Paul Getty from 1903 to 1939 Los Angeles. 1941, OCLC 693,373,380. Getty, J. Paul. Europe in the 18th Century, Privately Printed, 1949, OCLC 1,539,420. Levain, Ethel, and J. Paul Getty. Collector's Choice, 
The Chronicle of an Artistic Odyssey Through Europe. London, W. H. Allen, 1955, OCLC 901152222. Getty, J. Paul. My Life and Fortunes. New York, Duell, Sloan, and Pierce, 1963, OCLC 804426417. Getty, J. Paul. The Joys of Collecting. New York, Hawthorne Books, 1965, OCLC 756465638. Getty, J. Paul. How to Be Rich. Chicago, Playboy Press, 1965, OCLC 702557306. Getty, J. Paul. The Golden Age. New York, Trident Press, 1968, OCLC 3039906. Getty, J. Paul. How to Be a Successful Executive. Chicago, Playboy Press, 1971, OCLC 11409794. Getty, J. Paul. As I See It, The Autobiography of J. Paul Getty. Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, Prentice Hall, 1976. ISBN 0130495938X. OCLC 1078950701